Thanks for joining. In this lesson, we will practice how ASP.NET Core 7 works with HTTP protocol. We will cover topics such as requests and responses, headers, different types of requests, status codes, and more. If you have any questions or need clarification along the way, feel free to comment below. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more exciting lessons like this. Let's jump right in and start learning. The HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol is an application-level protocol used for communication between web browsers and web servers. When accessing a web page, we send an HTTP GET request, either by typing the URL directly into the browser address line or by clicking on a link. For example, if I type Microsoft.com into the address bar, the request will be sent to the server, also known as the backend for processing. The server will be listening on a specific address and port, waiting for this command to arrive. Once the request is received, the server executes the specific code in accordance with the request. In the provided code by Next for sample for the server startup, there is a declared get request using the map get function. If we send a get request to the root URL from the browser, this code will be automatically picked up by the server since it matches the request type the server received. The match specifically corresponds to a GET request to the root URL. If we change the URL to something else, the code will not work unless we modify our browser request to match the expected request required by the server. Additionally, if we send a different type of request like POST, PUT or DELETE, the server will not respond. It is crucial for the request type and logic to align with what the server is expecting. And of course, the server must be running for the code to execute. Let's start the server by pressing F5 in Visual Studio. I will send a request from the browser. And as you can see, the server has replied to me. This is generally how the Internet works. The request we just made is based on the HTTP protocol we discussed earlier. If you place the cursor in the browser's URL bar, you will see the protocol type display, which is HTTP. Every browser, such as Chrome, Opera, Firefox, or Edge, has developer tools available. These tools provide essential information about the communication between the client and server. They are also used for debugging, performance analysis, and more. To open the developer tools, you can press F12 on your keyboard or right-click on the web page and choose Inspect. Alternatively, you can press Ctrl-Shift-I if the F12 button doesn't work. During this course, I'll be using the Chrome browser. However, if you prefer to use a different browser, the process will be the same. When you open the Developer Tools or DevTools, you may feel slightly overwhelmed by the icons and amount of fields present. As always, you just need to get accustomed to it and it will become less intimidating over time. For now, we will focus on the Network tab in the DevTools, which allows to observe the information exchange between the client and the server. Assuming that the server is running on your computer in Visual Studio and you can see the Hello World response in the browser, you need to navigate to the DevTools Network tab. Once there, you can press the Page Reload button and the DevTools Network tab will update with the current request to the local host. Click on the local host entry, which represents the request we just sent to the server, and the HTTP protocol information will be displayed. The Network tab provides us with detailed information about the HTTP protocol for each request and response. Here, we will gain a comprehensive overview of the network activity of a web page, including the HTTP headers, request and response payloads, and other relevant information. Now let's discuss the concept of request and response between the browser and the server. I'll quickly show you a diagram that we previously covered in this lesson. As you can see, the process is straightforward. We send a request from the browser, and the server senses a response. The DevTool Network tab provides us with detailed information about these exchanges. In the Network tab, we have the Headers tab, which contains general information, response headers, and request headers. 
in the response tab we can see the actual response, which is the string we received from the server. Now let's examine the information in the headers tab. The general tab provides details such as request URL, which indicates the URL to which the request was made. It also specifies the type of the request, which in this case is get request. The status code is another crucial piece of information, and the code of 200 indicates that HTTP request was successful. We will discuss different types of requests, such as get and post, and status codes in more detail shortly. The string remote address refers to the network address of the remote server that handled the request. The referrer policy specifies the default referrer policy as strict origin when cross origin. This policy restricts the information included in the referrer header when navigating from one website to another. Next, let's discuss the response headers, which represent the response received from the server. The content type header specifies the media type and character encoding of the content in the HTTP response. In this case, the current content type header is set to text plain. Character set is UTF-8, indicating that the response contains plain text encoded using the UTF character encoding. The date header in the response headers indicates the timestamp when the response was generated by the server. It provides information about the timing of the response. The server header reveals the name of the type of the server that has responded. In this case, the server name is Kestrel, which is the server running now with ASP.NET Core 7 application. The transfer encoding header is set to chunked, indicating that the response body is sent in a series of chunks rather than being sent as a single entity. Chunk transfer encoding is used when the response size is unknown or when the content is streamed in parts. If you click on a row option on the response header, you will see the additional data on the very first line, which states HTTP slash 1.1 to 100 OK. This line indicates that the HTTP response is based on the widely used HTTP 1.1 protocol version. The 200k status code signifies that the request was successful, and the server is responding with the expected content. It's worth nothing that HTTP protocols can have different versions, and in this case it's HTTP 1.1, other available versions include HTTP 2 and HTTP 3. Next, I'll briefly explain status codes and their meanings. There are currently over 60 status codes available in the HTTP protocol. A status code is a three-digit numeric code included in the HTTP response sent by the server to the client, such as a web browser. It is used to communicate the outcome of the HTTP request in a standardized way. The purpose of the status codes in the HTTP protocol is to provide a consistent and uniform method for the server to convey information about the result of the request to the client. For example, when you refresh the page, you can observe the status code provided by the server. In this case, it shows a status code of 200, indicating that the request was successful. If you navigate to the headers tab, you will see the word OK display, which is part of the code series starting with the number 2. Status codes in the 200 series generally indicate successful requests. If you visit a website like google.com, you can find various status codes and their meanings. You don't need to memorize all of them, as you can easily search for a specific code and their explanations. Over time, you will naturally become familiar with the commonly encountered status codes and their implications. All this technical information is provided in the response header and is used by the browser to process and display the information. The information is represented in key-value pairs, where the string server is the key and Kestrel is the corresponding value. Along with the callback function that returns the string hello world, the server provides additional technical information behind the scene to the browser. We can review this response in the response tab, also known as the response body where we can see the string or response body from the server. 
Now let's practice working with server responses and see how we can modify this code to get something other than hello world. Just to remind you, the run method is used to start the ASP.NET Core 7 web server and handle incoming requests. It serves as the main entry point for your ASP.NET Core 7 application. On the other hand, the mapget method is used to map a specific URL pattern to a handler function, allowing you to create custom endpoints for your application. To make changes, I will comment out the map.get string and add an additional app.run string along with a few lines of code. Then I will press F5 in Visual Studio and the browser will start. As you can see, we have the response. And if we go to the DevTools, we can see the information provided by the server indicating the status code 500 that we chose to send from the server along with the message. Now let's discuss the code. The main purpose of the run method is to register middleware. In the upcoming topic, after we complete the HTTP section, we will delve into middleware in more detail. As you may recall from the previous lesson, we created an instance of the web application and the resulting app object represents the web application. With each request made, the app.run method executes the handler function. The handler function takes the context parameter, where HTTP context is the type of the parameter and context is the parameter's name. The HTTP context represents the context of the HTTP request and response being processed by the application. By indicating context as a parameter in the anonymous function, we make the HTTP context object available within the function scope. This allows us to access and work with properties and methods of the HTTP context object, such as accessing request and response data, modifying headers, reading and writing the response body, and more. In this specific code, the handler sets the status code of the response to 500, indicating an internal server error, and writes a corresponding message. Finally, App run is called without any parameters, which starts the web application and listens for incoming requests. Since this is the last app run registered, it serves as the final middleware handler in the pipeline. Now let's further modify this code and see how we can utilize the context object and access different types of data and see the debug console. If the debug console is empty, then you would need to restart your browser. So, with the for each loop, we access the context object and iterate over the key and value pairs. Now, if we compare the data displayed in the Visual Studio Debug Console with the data shown in the browser, we will notice that they are exactly the same. This includes the date and time information with no difference whatsoever. Let's add the request object in our code. I will add additional code to access the request object using context parameter within the handler function. And as you can see, we have a complete history of the information exchange between the client and the server. This includes the exact request made by the browser to the server and the corresponding response from the server to the browser. If you need to make these responses conditional based on a specific criteria or logic, you can implement your logical comparisons. For example, let's consider an if statement with a condition that is always false for demonstration purposes. So, the status code has been changed to 200, indicating a successful response and meaning that the if condition was not triggered, but the else was, and the type of response is a dictionary. We can use a for each loop to iterate over the key value pairs of the request and response headers. Additionally, we can add additional response headers by using key value pairs. Let's add this code to the response. Also, you can use add method to complete the same operation. And we have both headers in the server response. You can also override the default headers such as server and date. For example, if you change the date and server headers to a different value, the browser will display the modified string instead of the actual date. 
and both headers values are updated as we requested. So far we have been responding with the plain text, but we can also respond with the different data types. For example, if we want to respond with HTML to provide a formatted and visually appearing response to the user, we need to amend the content type header accordingly. By setting the content type header to text HTML, we indicate to the browser that the response should be treated as HTML content if there is any. Now we have HTML formatted text, and if we navigate to the Elements tab in the DevTools and inspect the HTML code, we can see the text string enclosed in h2 tag. Additionally, if you switch to the console tab, you will find there error 500 provided by the server. In the HTTP response, there are several commonly used headers that provide various information and control the behavior of the client or browser. Throughout the course, we will discuss these headers in detail. However, for now, let's provide a list of commonly used response headers along with their description. You don't need to memorize all of these headers right away. Simply read through the list to get familiar with their meanings and purposes. Referring to the diagram we saw earlier in this lesson about requests and responses, I have made some amendments to include different types of requests that can be sent to the server. With HTTP requests we have the ability to send various types of data and information based on the request method and the specific requirements of the server. So far, all the requests we have been sending were GET requests. We observed this in the browser's DevTools, where you could see the request method specified as GET in the header's data. When we access a URL directly, it automatically results in a GET request. In this scenario, we send a GET request. The server receives it and then provides us with a corresponding response. Here I have provided the different request types and the types of data they typically handle. A GET request is encoded in the URL parameters, while a POST request submits its data using the request body. We will discuss these request types in details throughout this course. Previously in this lesson we iterated over the request and response headers, but the request object is huge and we can see additional items available there. Let's write additional code. I will create a variable, call it recPath and recHost, which is request path and request host. And since the content type is HTML, we can make use of div text to display the outputs on separate lines. Additionally, I will change the status to 200. As you can see, we are now retrieving the request host and path. If I modify the path to lesson 2, it will be reflected in our page. Similarly, in the DevTools we will see the updated path displayed as lesson 2. Let's explore additional information that we can retrieve from the request object. I will add the method property to our code and browser says the method is get. Now we are one step closer to implementing the logic for our endpoints. Endpoints typically contain a logic that differentiates one request from another. Let's implement conditions and enrich our logic with variety. Now we are checking if the method is get. If it is, we have two options. Either the path is slash user or it's the root path. Let's check them. So the output of the browser is correct, meaning the backend responded correctly. And that's it for this lesson. In the next lesson, we will practice with query strings. And as always, lesson assignments. At the conclusion of each lesson, I highly encourage you to complete the assignments, as they will greatly contribute to your progress in ASP.NET Core 7. By consistently practicing, you will see faster results in your learning journey. And the assignments answers you can download from the GitHub. The link is below. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or need further assistance, feel free to comment below. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more great coding content. Stay updated with the latest videos by ringing the notification bell. Happy coding!